we're gathered here on a solemn occasion, but with so many friends and family here, I can't help but say that it's also a happy occasion. We really do appreciate those of you who came from in town and those of you who came from out of town to be here for the funeral of our mother, Elaine Hafen Briggs. Uh, so without any further ado, we'll begin with our program and will uh, Miriam, if Miriam will come forward and we'll do our, uh, our opening hymn and then I believe you all have programs and it doesn't need to be further introduced to you, we'll just proceed as the program is outlined. Thank you.
Dear Heavenly Father, we gather here today to celebrate the life of Elaine Briggs. We celebrate and give thanks for a devoted mother and spouse, a loyal family and church member, a good neighbor and dedicated teacher, a friend to us all. We are all better because of her life and presence these past 90 years. We pray that today's speakers convey their thoughts in a way that might bring joy and comfort to us all, that we may say farewell for now until we meet again. We pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Elaine Hapen was born November 17, 1918, in St. George, Utah, the first of nine children born to Guy and Althea Hapen. She was signed a week earlier, a week before her birth, and her father, who was serving in the military, had the momentary wish that she had been born a week earlier on Armistice Day. Then they would have named her Liberty or Flag or Victoria. Mom's first memories were of moving into the new house that her parents built at 97 West, 200 North Street in St. George. She was four and her brother Earl was two. Many years later, she remembered this of the experience. The folks had decided it would save much time if they could be closer to the daily construction of the house. When the water and toilet were in, they made the move. The only completed portion of the house was the basement and the cement slab that would one day become the wire room. To get to the bathroom, we walked across planks placed on top of the floor joists above the basement. Earl and I made frequent trips to the bathroom by ourselves, but it made Mother a nervous wreck for fear we might miss one of the planks and fall into the basement. Remembering Grandma, I can only imagine the truthfulness of that last statement. Mom spent her growing up years in St. George. She attended Woodward Elementary, Dixie High School, and Dixie Junior College. She was active in school functions, participating in school plays, helping with floats and banners, and cheering for the football and basketball team. She had the Dixie spirit. Pictures from her growing up year show her mostly socializing with friends or dressed up in what looked like impromptu fashion shows. Her friends at the time included Rhoda Cannon, Grace Cottom, Adrienne MacArthur, Esther Woodbury, Edith Sullivan, Shirley Webb, Fawn Schmutz, and Adelia Hall. Her friend Grace Cottom Dalton re recently sent this memory to mom. When we were in high school, our, our crowd, six of us, went to the dances. It was coming up on Halloween, and we were once again wondering if we should all dress alike as we did the previous year to win the prize and what kind of a costume we should wear. Elaine and Rhoda were our leaders, and they decided that we should dress like pink elephants. There was a popular song at the time about pink elephants, and she adds in parentheses, it was probably an inebriate song. Elaine and Rhoda purchased a bolt of pink flannel, and with the help of, mother, uh, of mothers, devised a pattern. Then we all went to work. The part I remember most was stuffing the elephant's trunks. You'd be surprised how good they looked. We laughed a lot. When we arrived at the dance, we were greeted with hooting and applause. Of course, we won the prize again. We marched around in a circle doing a little dance and received applause from the crowd while the band played Pink Elephants. Elaine and Rhoda were bosom pals, and we danced to their tune, for it was always a good tune. They always held leadership positions, and that was to our advantage. While mom enjoyed the bounties of the local farm economy, she apparently con never considered it a career in spite of winning a five-year award for 4-H activities in 1936. Instead, at age, si at age 16, she started work at Snow's Dress Shop, one of the businesses in town, and worked holidays and vacations for the next eight years. This was a lot more fun than picking peaches in the heat of summer, and at the going wage of 35 cents an hour, it was good money for her. In the fall of 1938, Maurice Briggs and Elaine Hafen met while attending Dixie College and began dating. Dad was active in school life as class president and being on the football team. Mom was also very active in school life, serving as class secretary 
being in plays, and serving as a princess in the spring queen court. As I recall one of her stories about a play she was in, she said she made a mistake by reciting a second act line in the first act, thereby moving the story along. <laughs> After graduating in May 1939, they went their separate ways, dad to BYU, mom to Utah Agricultural College in Logan on a $30 scholarship. She graduated from Utah Agricultural College with a Bachelor of Science degree in Home Economics in 1941. A report card from her senior year shows A's and B's in principles of teaching, practice teaching, elementary school curriculum, and seminars in child development. She then got a teaching job in the Salt Lake City school system where she taught for several years. When World War II came along, Dad shipped out as a Marine for the South Pacific. They didn't see each other for three and a half years during this time, but kept in touch through letters. At some point during this time, Mom moved to San Francisco where she stayed with her friend, Adelia Hall. Mom had received word that Dad had been wounded on Saipan. In a phone conversation with Dad, he told her what had happened and told her not to come. But she did, and they quickly renewed the relationship. They were married shortly thereafter on December 9, 1944, in a double ring ceremony with her friend Adelia Hall. Mom and Dad lived in San Francisco for the first few years of their marriage, later moving to Oakland just before Rob was born, and then moving to San Lorenzo in 1951, where they raised their family of five children and lived for the next 51 years. Mom was active in raising her children. She was a a Cub Scout den mother various times, saw that we had piano, dance, and swim lessons, saw us through our little league years, school sports, scouting trips, and project, girls camp, dance festivals, seminary, paper routes, church activities, and whatever else came along. I remember my infrequent piano practice was frequently just before dinner, and while she was preparing dinner and I was pounding the piano, she would call out, Brent, make music, as if that were a possibility. She stayed interested in school functions and served as a PTA president of both the elementary and junior high schools we attended. She held many positions in church, mostly in the Relief Society at both the ward and stake level. One of her favorite assignments was to give book reviews in Relief Society. I don't know how many sisters she inspired to read, but I know it rubbed off on us. And she never seemed too bothered by the broken arms, legs, and noses we suffered or that her flower beds became burial grounds for various pets. As we got older, Mom's interest in teaching renewed. She substitute taught for several years before becoming a full-time teacher at Lorenzo Manor Elementary School at age 52, first as a kindergarten, then as a second grade teacher. She taught full time for 13 years and retired at age 65. At the retirement dinner given in honor of several retiring teachers, they were mom's stories that brought the house down. One of her favorite stories she told that night was of a boisterous but likable student. <clears throat> One day on the playground after yet another chastising from mom, the young boy turned to mom and said, well, what do you expect, Mrs. Briggs, when you've been raised by wolves? <laughs> mom has always had a close connection to her immediate and extended family, so family reunions were always a joy to her. I still remember her and dad climbing a hill at age 80 to watch the rest of us do a ropes course in the mountains near Ridge. Neither one of them wanted to be left out. She especially liked the storytelling that was always a part of reunions, but she believed that they should be more than picnics, and when reunions were held here in St. George, she included visits to the dinosaur track south of town, Silver Reef, the Pintura Cemetery, Grafton, and any other highlights she thought we should know about. Before retiring, she and Dad began to travel, and their adventures continued after retirement. Sometimes it was by themselves to see family members and friends in various parts of the country, including their longtime friends, the Shumways in Arizona, Uncle Tom in Florida and Arizona, Aunts Valerie and Gloria and Uncles Gene and Bill on the East Coast, and Mom's brother, Uncle Richard, and Dad's sister, Aunt Felice, here in St. George. Mom would always return with stories of Aunt Valerie's grand tours or pithy remarks by Uncle Gene or stories by Uncle Richard. Mom and Dad's traveling companions also included their dear friends from San Lorenzo, the Shumways, Oslers, and Palmers. At various times, they went to Finland and Russia, China, 
Egypt and Israel, a boat trip through the Pan Panama Canal, South Carolina and the Epcot Center, and southern Utah and the north rim of the Grand Canyon. When a friend on that trip commented how she disliked the arid southwest, mom rose to the defense of the desert's beauty. She also took a raft trip through the Grand Canyon with my sister Beverly when mom was in her late 50s. In the mid to late 1990s, mom took writing classes for seniors at the local junior college. Whatever the assignment, mom always had plenty of material to use based on growing up in southern Utah. She ended up compiling a small booklet of her writings with, short, with story titles such as Motakwa, The Marcel, Zion Mount Carmel Tunnel, Boulder Dam, Canning, and Reginald about her brother who passed away. It has been a great source of enjoyment for all of us, not just because the stories are about mom's life, but also life and history here in St. George from many years ago. And she enjoyed it so much when we read to her during the last several years. <clears throat> and it always amazed us when she would correct our pronunciation of words, oftentimes before we'd even finish the word. In the last six to eight years of her life, mom has battled Alzheimer's disease, which has slowly robbed her of her memory and other mental capabilities. But the disease never changed her personality. She was always pleasant and grateful for anything people did for her throughout the last several years, and several CNAs at the facility in Rexburg told us last week that mom was their favorite resident. Um, <clears throat> I have one last story, if I can get it out, um, about how her personality remained intact. On a visit to see her a couple of years ago, I stopped by the local nursery one morning and bought half a dozen containers of sagebrush, the same sagebrush that covers most of the western United States. Sagebrush has always had a romantic place in my heart. I love the smell and it reminds me of the West in general and Southern Utah in particular and I thought it would go nicely in my dry landscape garden in California. So I bought a half a dozen. And when I went to visit her I said, Mom, guess where I've been this morning? And she said, where? And I said, to the nursery. And guess what I bought? And she said, what? And I said, sagebrush. <clears throat> and she looked at me and she said, oh Brent like I had committed the ultimate betrayal against her family and had spent good money to do so. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Good afternoon. I'd like to start off by thanking you for coming today. It means a lot to us as family members. Mom touched a lot of people's lives and your support has been very much appreciated. I would like to especially thank Rich and Cindy for their devotion to her during the last four years. It was a difficult transition for her to move to Idaho, but they provided much tender, loving care. Additionally, I'd like to thank Brent, who always checked on mom and dad during their later years in San Lorenzo. He inherited her compassionate heart. Also, a special thanks to those of you in St. George who visited and checked in on them during their time at Sterling Court. I would like to review with you some remembrances I have of my mother by identifying some of her outstanding characteristics. I believe these will make an enduring legacy for those who knew her. The first is her loving and caring dedication to her family and friends. The relationships that were most important to her were as daughter, sister, cousin, wife, mother, aunt, and grandmother. She was interested and concerned about all and desired to stay in contact with them. She was rarely judgmental, but usually encouraging, wanting to bring out the best in each person. Maintaining strong familial relationships was very important to her. My parents were married for nearly 60 years. Together they raised five children. There was the usual amount of give and take, accomplishments, achievements, and dashed dreams. Unlike today, the only sport you could play until you reached high school was Little League Baseball. So she made sure we had lots of other enriching activities to do 
once we returned home from school. Piano lessons, tap dancing lessons, yes, even my brothers took tap dancing lessons, and many scouting activities. One Christmas time during a two-week period, four of us were in car accidents. Luckily, nothing serious. Through it all, she maintained a thankful and positive attitude. As we married and had children of our own, she expanded her love and circle of influence. She was able to make a specific connection with each grandchild. My son Brian, who's unable to be here today, describes it this way. Whether it was Christmas at their house or camping out during the summer, Grandma would round up all the cousins, acquiescent or not, and read some story or teach some lesson. This is a rare thing. This, to me, is an invaluable thing, not necessarily because of the values that such lessons aim to teach, but because someone cared enough to want to teach them to us. Second, I would like to mention her appreciation of the beauties of the earth. There are some who think that St. George is not a pretty place. However, to mom, it was full of beauty. The colors of a sunset on the red sandstone, a cactus in bloom, or seeing a ditch full of water were all things of beauty to her. During our growing up years, we visited most of the national parks in the western United States for our summer vacations. She thought each one was breathtakingly beautiful. She would remind us of the need to preserve the beauty we saw by repeating this saying. Let no one say it, and say it to your shame, that there was beauty here until you came. When I had recently graduated from college, I needed a partner to accompany me on a river rafting trip down the Grand Canyon, so I called my mom. She was more than willing to join me, and as Brent mentioned, she was in her mid to late 50s at that time. We enjoyed a week-long trip floating down the Grand Canyon, observing the various layers of metamorphic rock, some estimated to be a billion years old. Mom wanted to absorb all that she could. Then a couple of years later, I invited her to go to Europe with me. It was a BYU-sponsored trip with Marion Bentley as our tour guide. We had an enjoyable time seeing the sights, shopping, and imagining what life would have been like four or five centuries ago. She befriended many people and enjoyed getting to know them. When my parents were in their late 60s and early 70s, they took many trips with friends to see other parts of the world. They have seen most of Europe, visited sites in the former Soviet Union, cruised around seaports in the Mediterranean, and toured parts of China. Her travels have taken her to see many captivating places throughout the world. She was intrigued by the, di the diversity of the beauty she saw and was thankful for the natural beauty of the world. Lastly, I would like to mention her love of reading and writing. Maybe it was due to her school teaching experiences but she always thought it important to be reading a good book and to be able to express oneself well. In the olden days, she was often called upon to give book reports in Relief Society, whereas later that evolved into being a member of several different book clubs. She usually had several books lined up to read, and reading to her children and grandchildren was something that was important to her. She must have had the original idea for books on tape as we would read as we traveled on vacation, where she would be laughing and crying through many a book. As a young mother, she wrote weekly letters home to her parents. I can't imagine how she found the time to do this, but I know they were well received. It was important to her to stay connected to her family from far away California. They couldn't just text each other as her grandkids do today. She also attempted a family newsletter for several years in which she encouraged her children and grandchildren to express themselves. Not only was this a way of staying in touch, but it also documented the various activities of each family. About 10 or 15 years ago, she took some writing classes in which the instructor encouraged her to write about her childhood. She decided she would like to collate these stories and give them as a present to her family at the turn of the century. In her introduction, she wrote, quote, So it is that I feel compelled to leave to my children and grandchildren a link to the past as I am able to see it. Remembering is a lot of fun. These are recollections of days gone by when simple pleasures were enough and luxury was far out of reach. 
These easy to remember memories are for my brothers and sisters and for the young ones in our family, as well as generations to come. I am grateful beyond measure for family and friends who have shared and celebrated happy times with me. I am grateful for the provisions of food, shelter, clothing, and other necessities of everyday living. Undergirding all, I am grateful for my deep and unwavering faith in the love and ultimate goodness of God's plan for each of us." Unquote. And I, as her daughter, am grateful beyond measure for a warm, caring, and dedicated mother who taught me about the good in life through her example. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
<clears throat> when my mom lived at the Homestead Assisted Living Center in Rexburg, Idaho, I would pick her up and bring her out to our home. She would ask, sometimes more than once, how far is it out to your place? I'd say it's about four miles. And she'd say, that's not even to Santa Clara. <laughs> when you would help her from a chair, she would ask, have you had your Wheaties? And when you would help her put on her shoes, she would say, aren't you glad I'm not a centipede? <laughs> we do not need to be perfect or even near perfect to leave a good legacy. Our legacy is based on what we do with our talents and how we treat other people. Of the two, the second is more important. If we trip or fall somewhere along the path of life, we can get up, we can change and do better. We can do more and be more. Within the last year, there was a family event I thought my mom would really enjoy. But as time got short, it didn't seem there would be enough time to get her and make the necessary preparations. I felt bad. And then it occurred to me. It actually hit me. My mom is with me wherever I go. Whenever I get outside of myself and show kindness to another person, whenever I expect a little more from a student, whenever I develop my talent, that is the influence of my mother. On his recent birthday, Thomas Monson, prophet and leader of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, was asked what members of the church could give him and his response was something like this, find someone who needs help and help them. My mom found people who needed help and she accepted help when she needed it. And that's the best that we can be. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This phrase has caught my attention lately. Life is not measured by the amount of breaths you take, but by the moments that take your breath away. The following words are linked to moments that take breath away. I quote from the cover page of Elaine's writings, love, hope, joy, peace, giving, sharing, understanding, forgiveness, these are the guiding stars we should follow each day, end of quote. Moments that might take one's breath away can be loud with excitement and high energy. I believe that most are subtle. They sink into the deep places in our hearts where they, where they become permanent and never to be forgotten. Some breathtaking moments are common to many people such as the birth of a child or the death of a loved one when we feel that we are standing in sacred space. A beautiful sunset, the harmony of voices to a wonderful arrangement of music or the enjoyment of nature where we <clears throat> feel the quiet connection to earth and all creation. These are familiar such moments. They're often private and individual or done as a group. A lot of my own breathtaking moments are connected to other women, in addition to Rich and as a mother. Many of these moments with other women revolve around my mother and Elaine. Rich and I took our family back to San Lorenzo from Moscow one Thanksgiving as a surprise. Elaine and Maurice were not expecting us.
mm, I can't do this and be able to read it. Elaine and Maurice were not expecting us. We walked through the garage door leading to the big family room. They were watching television and holding hands across the arms of the recliner chairs. There was a peace grown from close to 60 years of marriage. This was a moment to take your breath away. In this same moment, Maurice got tears in his eyes and he said, well, look who's here. Elaine laughed and smiled and held out her arms. I suspect that we took their breath away in the very best sense. Other moments that have taken my breath away. When I could see her and Maurice head out to do their home teaching, these were not assignments or duties, nor trying to beat the calendar. They visited because they genuinely cared about people. They were interested in how things were going. Love in all of its storm and glory can wrench the heart. When others were hurting, they had empathy. This is something beyond sympathy. They loved their garden, and Grandma was a master canner. She appreciated what it took to put food on the table, and she enjoyed doing it. The many times around the big table that Rich and I now lovingly treasure were so memorable. They were times of gathering, having fun, conversing, and reaping reaping in some breathtaking moments. I have snapshot images in my mind, like the click of a camera. Insight was given, lessons were learned. A grandchild was about to run out, anxious to feed the ducks, and they would hear from Elaine, wait a minute, wait a minute, come on over here. And the child was given a kiss and a hug before they were on their way. Love was in action. There was a sense of security and of acceptance. It is easy for all of us to cast back in our minds to the holiday gatherings. The feeling of warmth and kindness in home prevailed. Each person was part of the whole and they counted. The marvelous reunions that involved days and themes and education and sharing talents were so valuable. Numbers were large, but within that great wholeness, you were recognized by Elaine as important and as a needed individual. In casting back, she would share of ancestors' strengths and their sacrifices. These events were filled with subtle moments that can take your breath away. Elaine was a lifelong learner. The travel groups, the study groups, the writing class, the seminars and the concerts, the reading and the careful listening to others are a few of the things that brought her some breathtaking moments. The entire Hafen family are lifelong learners, with Ralph now as our senior example. It is truly inspiring. Our son Bennett remembers so many times on the trips out to Grandma and Grandpa's skipping rocks at the various beaches where we stopped and watching the ripples. This is the legacy of Grandma. She lived to have an effect on all that she came into contact with. About four years ago, prior to Elaine coming to live with us, Rich and I attended a workshop about dementia. One professional declared that as dementia enters the avenues of the mind, you often see and hear as someone totally unfamiliar to you, and you might find yourself asking, who is this person? At the same meeting, another statement was that as dementia interrupts the thought process, all surface conditioning is washed away from the mind, and you will see that person's true identity, and they will be like they were as a young child. I did not need to have known Elaine as a young child to see her for who she was. As memory faded in and out, she never lost her attitude of gratitude. She thanked one and all for even the most minute services that she received. Even in Elaine's last few days, when she could only with difficulty say a few words that were hard to understand, they were the words, thank you, as she was told that she was loved. On a number of occasions, our stake president has cautioned us that we live far below our privileges. The moments that take our breath away are those when we get outside ourselves, when we serve, when we love and grow. They're moments of victory over self, of resolution to problems, of finding direction and calm amidst a terrible turmoil. They're forgiveness in pain. They're finding moral identity when the social conscious is very askew. When we take advantages of our privileges and our advantages, we are in breathtaking moments. I've long had a piece of paper taped to my cupboard. Written on the paper are the words, the larger the lake of knowledge, the longer the shore of wonder. 
I suggest to the grandchildren and all the rest of us here, let's look for and find, enjoy and appreciate the moments of wonder, the moments that will take our breath away. We will live as Grandma did. We will turn our hearts to each other. Marshall. You are the youngest grandchild, and you witnessed some of the early and most intense seizures that Grandma had. We learned a lesson. Sometimes God asks us or allows us to do something hard, even right up to the end. I am comforted in thinking of Heavenly Father's trust in Grandma, in her strength that she could do one more hard thing with courage. My nephew Christian, when recently asked about his mission, said it was more than I expected. I felt his love and appreciation. Let us make our lives ring with moments that are more than we expected in love and appreciation. Grandma ends her cover note on her writings with this, and Beverly has already shared, I am grateful beyond measure for family and friends who have shared and celebrated happy times with me. I am grateful for the provisions of food, shelter, clothing, and other necessities of everyday life, undergirding all for my deep and unwavering faith in the love and ultimate goodness of God's plan for each of us. My wish for each of you is an abundance of health, joy, peace. Now and in the days to come, all of my love, Elaine. I leave these thoughts with a testimony that we will see her again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. My parents returned to St. George and lived here for a few years before my father passed away. They had selected some of their things to bring from their modest home in California to a smaller apartment. And among the things they brought was a rock, mineral, and fossil collection from my mother's rock hounding days. They kept these natural history specimens on the patio outside their apartment. When my father passed away, it was time to select again which things would travel with my mother, which things would stay, and which would be cast off. There was a small, dark, flat mudstone that was split along its side in two halves. When opened, it revealed a fossilized leaf print mirrored on both sides. It is, it is a finely divided pinnate leaf with small leaflets on opposite sides of a slender stem. It is molded and rendered in minute detail. I took it. It had been my mother's and it reminded me of her, a delicate surprise encased in clay. When I think of my mother, I think of a, do of a doer. It was not uncommon in our small kitchen, at our small kitchen table to push aside some jars of homemade preserves that were cooling to one corner of the table to make room for us to sit and eat dinner together. 
My father had a ward member construct some shelves to line one side of the garage and enclose them so that it became a long, narrow closet with two doors but no place to walk, only shelves. My mother filled it with her homemade pickled just about everything, her bottled jams and jellies. And when they moved here to St. George, bottled goodies, some of them decades old, were discarded. But they had served a purpose, laid up against a time of need that gratefully never came. My mother's family's nickname for her was Sal, which was short for salvation. As the oldest of nine children, she was the assistant cook, nurse, and nursery leader, and hence her mother's salvation. When time came for her to raise her own family, she was a very natural mother, nurturer, and teacher. Was I the only one awake in the back of the car as we crossed a darkened desert, or was she just talking to me, pointing out some detail of Western historical interest? Most of my familiarity with the Old Testament is still based on my mother's reading, uh, reading Bible stories to me. She read to me and Rich, her younger children, on summer afternoons, and a knock might come at the door. It was a neighbor, Gary or Bruce, inviting us to come out to play. But Mom insisted, they can come in and listen if they want, but we're going to finish here first. By the time I got to school, I was already known to most of the teachers because my three older siblings were trailblazers of sorts. <clears throat> But they knew me also because of my mother. She was active in PTA in all our schools, and so it was not unusual for the principal to know me by name before I ever started. My mother was upset when my father turned over some more sod from the backyard to, make, to expand a vegetable garden, but she soon forgot. She delighted in serving a summer supper and listing on her fingers the things on the table that had come from their garden. She would inform the diners what was for dinner and would add, and the corn, tomatoes, onions, cucumbers, radishes, carrots, and beans are from our garden. Once after I was married and working, my father told me the most he had ever earned in a year. Even taking into account inflation, I was astonished. And I asked myself, how did they do it? I'm sure it was a combination, but my mother was the designated bill payer, bill payer of the family. I remember her dipping a fountain pen into an ink well to write checks. I would put the lid of the ink bottle, uh, I would put the lid on the ink bottle and imitate her shake of the wrist to draw ink into the little reservoir near the mouth of the jar and watch her dip the pen and then write. For some reason, this pen was used only for special special occasions, writing letters home or writing checks. And even after ballpoint pens were plentiful, I believe that she finished that probably to make sure the ink was used. Her thrift paid off, and their later years were marked by retirement and time and money to travel with friends to many parts of the world. Probably 10 years ago, I visited mom and dad in their home, the only house they ever bought and in which they lived for over 50 years. They gave me a check as they periodically did uh, to their children. I thanked them for it. I said, I now know that this represents a lifetime of savings and sacrifice. My dad cried. My mom looked at her lap and neither said anything. Mom taught elementary school for 13 years and brought home, families from, uh, brought home stories from her students that we added to our reper repertoire. Like the kindergartner, Sean, who said, my dad's for peace and so am I. Or the second grader, John Lyon, who said, what do you expect, Mrs. Briggs? I was raised by wolves. <clears throat> she enjoyed her, her students and we learned to enjoy them, enjoy them vicariously through her. The retired kindergartner teacher turned full-time grandmother was careful to remember each grandchild's birthday and other important events. Even in her later years in their home, when she showed signs of slowing down and no longer led every conversation, I noticed that she would slip into the front room where my children were holding their own gathering just to watch them play. This careful remembrance of her grandchildren was her hallmark, so it was doubly hard to see some of those precious memories slip away. 
I can still feel the bridge of my mother's nose on my temple just above my ear. She is whispering to me that if I sit still and listen until after the sacrament has been blessed and passed, that she will draw circles on the back of the program and I can make faces in them. Then we sang, and I think she sang as fervently as any in the congregation. We'll sing all hail to Jesus' name and praise and honor give to him who bled on Calvary's hill and died that we might live. He passed the portal of the grave. Salvation was his song. He called upon the sin-bound soul to join the heavenly throng. He seized the keys of death and hell and bruised the serpent's head. He bid the prison doors unfold. The grave yield up her dead. The bread and water represent his sacrifice for sin. Ye saints partake and testify. Ye do remember him. Mom wrote personal history essays. In 1999, she compiled them and made them Christmas presents. Her, interest, her introduction reads, to family and friends, all who read this history, love, hope, joy, peace, giving, sharing, understanding, forgiveness. These are the guiding stars that we should follow each day and especially at this Christmas season. Just as on that star-filled night nearly 2,000 years ago, a special star illuminated the way for the wise men's journey to find, to find the Holy Child, may we strive to follow, to always follow with trust, patience, and obedience these divinely guided ideals. And she continues, as another year draws near, uh, as another as the end of another year draws near, we prepare and we prepare for the holiday season, I reflect on the purpose and meaning of Christmas, the event, the remembrance, the celebration, and I count my blessings. I am grateful beyond measure for family and friends who have shared and celebrated good times with me. I am grateful for the provisions of food, shelter, clothing, and other necessities of everyday life. Undergirding all, I am grateful for my deep and unwavering faith in the love and ultimate goodness of God's plan for each of us." Close quote. The prophet Joseph Smith declared, the fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and prophets regarding uh, Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven, and all other things which, per which pertain to our religion are only appendages to it. As the, Apostle, as the Apostle Paul said to the people of Corinth, if in this life only we have hope in Jesus Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But our faith and hope is in the resurrected Christ. For as in, for as in Adam all men die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. I believe that this was the deep and unwavering faith that my mother spoke of. It is my faith and hope that we shall all be reunited again because of the ultimate goodness of God's plan for each of us, because of the life and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So sing we now at parting one more strain of praise. I thank my mother for her lifelong example to me of goodness and generosity and so many other virtues. I thank our Heavenly Father for the sacrifice of his Son for us and for the faith and hope of that blessed reunion that, re that unites us here today. Praise him for his mercy. Praise him for his love. For unnumbered blessings, praise the Lord above. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much to those that have spoken and also for the beautiful musical numbers. Uh, I believe that we have uh, 10 minutes or so if uh, for any of you who feel so inclined to come forward and share a thought or a remembrance, we'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you. I'm, <clears throat> for those of you who may not know me, I'm Richard. I'm the youngest in the family or also known as the baby. And I want to tell one little experience. Uh, when Elaine was a young girl, and there are other people in this audience that will relate with this, in these big uh, LDS families, they had to learn to help their mother and take care of the children. And I was the youngster, and she was uh, 
obviously had to help tend me and do a lot of different things. And one time we were talking and they were saying, oh, she was saying to her friends, do you remember Richard this and Richard that? And then they turned around and said, well, do you remember Elaine? And I said, well, no, not very well. <laughs> and <laughs> it made her feel kind of bad, but uh, we've gotten over that. I, I just have a couple of thoughts. And first, my first thought is, is I'm just so proud of the family here and uh, the way they've uh, prepared and the excellence that they've delivered their portions of the program. And it's, it's just been outstanding in every way. And as far as Elaine and myself, I've tried to think of something that I could sum it up in a in a short statement. And uh, on the computer, I've been reading quite a bit about bundles. You get a, if you'll buy this, then you get some more things in a bundle. And I would just like to tell you that my memories of Elaine are just a wonderful bundle of memories that I will never forget and that that's the part that I would like to leave with you today. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. those that can come forward. I'm really going to regret that that story that was just told may not have made it onto the video camera, but thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. I'm not going to be able to speak. Um, I'm 
just had a few a few thoughts. I've really enjoyed the the stories that have been shared. And they've helped me learn more about my grandma. And they've helped me learn a little bit about why I am the way I am. Because of the legacy that she and my grandpa have passed down. And it's, it's an amazing thing. The importance of family, the importance of education. Keeping close family ties. I hope I can be like my grandma, like my grandpa. My uh, patriarchal blessing, which for LDS members is a blessing that you can receive, which, which tells you a little bit about your potential in life. And it's a, it's a personal thing. And mine mentions the, that reminds me to remember that much of what I have is because of those who have gone before me and continued in, in faith. And I think that's, that's what my grandma did. And I hope that I can live the way that she did. And I hope that I can pass on to my children what she passed on to hers. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I would just like to ma mention that this darling Elaine was my sister-in-law. And her brother, Earl, I don't know if any of you remember him, but he was my husband. And we got married down in Texas. And she came down to Texas to be there when he and I got married. I'll never forget it, and I think it was so very wonderful of her, because once we got married, <clears throat> excuse me, we kind of went off by ourselves, but I presume she went home because she had lots of children. She was one darling woman, and not only that, she was very, very intelligent, and she was very kind to everybody I ever knew. I'll miss her greatly, but I know that where she is, that those around her are so glad to have her there with them. And I think even Heavenly Father is glad that she's with him. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. They just told me to behave myself. <laughs> even though, uh, well, my name is Jeff Hafen, and even though Herschel and Ramona are my parents, I distinctly remember when I was uh, the favorite son of Elaine and Maurice Briggs uh, for an hour. Uh, because of their generosity, and they were very generous, <clears throat> Uh, and probably not just to me, but a lot of people. I remember we had gone down to uh, Val and Daryl Carlson's, where's their wedding, and uh, <laughs> it was their wedding, but it was our party, I think, and we were having so much fun. I remember Elaine and Maurice invited me to go with the family out to breakfast at a Denny's, as I recall. And, uh, and then afterwards, there was a trip down to uh, SeaWorld. And just having been returned from my mission, I was dirt poor, and they took care of me. Anyway, so we're at breakfast at Denny's, and <clears throat> all of us in a pretty good mood. And the waitress came and said, uh, can I offer you some coffee? She was talking to me. Can I offer you some coffee? And I looked up at her, and I said, 
and defile my body. And that poor waitress, <laughs> she, I don't think she knew what to say. Or, uh, she, it took her a while to recoup, but uh, I, ever since that time, even this morning in the line, they have asked me if I've defiled my body yet. Well, obviously I have, but not because of the coffee. <laughs> anyway, thank you. I'm Greg Hafen. I'm the oldest nephew and uh, the oldest grandson, I think, um, of Guy and Althea. But I remember a very important date, and uh, that was just after I had graduated uh, from uh, high school. I was about 18 years of age, and I was going to go scuba diving with a buddy of mine by the name of Artie Anderson. And it was November, and uh, I really wanted to go scuba diving. But my father and, uh, and Elaine were very close, and we lived within 100 miles of each other, and uh, my parents said, well, you'll disappoint Elaine and Maurice if you don't go to Thanksgiving with us. And so I got tucked in to going up and participating in one more family reunion of the California tribe, and had a great and wonderful Thanksgiving at that time. And unbeknownst to me that uh, my friend and another friend had gone out partying the night of Thanksgiving, and I got back and we were supposed to go scuba diving the next day. And my friend was driving a car and was a little bit inebriated and ran into a gas station and killed himself. And uh, had I stayed home, I would have been with him and probably not been able to be here. So I'm very grateful to my Aunt Elaine and my parents for making sure that we stuck together as a family. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I'm Dee Dee Shumway, and one of those friends who traveled the world with them and shared almost in every event that took place in San Lorenzo, California. I am so grateful for my friendship for our friendship uh, with the Briggs family. And, and I count every day the blessings that I have received from Elaine as I was a new convert in the church. And she was very encouraging and uplifting and strengthening and sh showed me the way. There were times when I felt inadequate in some of the callings that I had. But she assured me that I, could, that I could accomplish that, that I could do it, and that I could handle it. We had long talks sometimes after Relief Society, if you remember, it lasted. It, it was in the evenings during the week at that time, and we would talk for long, a long periods of time and get home kind of late. But I'm grateful to her because she's very, so very uplifting and encouraging and it was through her that I grew, and I attribute, attribute my growth in the church to her. I loved her um, book reports and book reviews and her lessons. I, they were a strength in my life. One little story that I remember about when we were traveling, it was, I think we were in Russia, and we were the bus was filled and about ready to leave. And as the bus started up and began to move, Archie, we called him Archie, we, he jumped up and he said, wait, wait, you can't leave. You're about to leave the most important person in, on this bus here. It's my wife. <laughs> and it, Elaine was just elated to think that that uh, 
the arch jumped up and, and uh, didn't um, l allow the bus to take her away from him. I am so grateful for the friendship that we've had with the Briggs family and want them to know that we consider them a part of our family. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you very much. Um, Brother uh, Spilsbury will direct us in just a moment, but I have a, one little piece of family business, and that is the internment will follow immediately after, and then after that, all of you are invited to go to Staley's Catering in Washington, and we can tell you where it is later. And, uh, and our meal, the family meal, will be at 5 o'clock, but I understand that we can uh, begin to congregate over there at 4.30. So, but, and the way it works out, it maybe you can go home and change your clothes or whatever, but we'd like all of you who, who can attend to join with us over there. Thank you. And so now we'll have our closing hymn. Thank you.
Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for having the life of our sweet Elaine. She has been steady. She has been helpful and helped us all to kind of be sustained with her goodness throughout our lives. And we ask to have encircling arms around her as she greets others that will love her, that have passed on. Father, we are so grateful to be in to be interconnected as a family and to have the connections we have that are deep with a large family and great friends who together help us to know who we are and to help us try to become better. We are for so grateful for the love that we have for one another. And Father, we thank thee for the comfort of this meeting and the knowledge of what we have. And we ask a special blessing upon Elaine's and Maurice's children that they will never feel alone, that they will have the inspiration and the expectations that their parents have taught them to be with them all their lives and that they will, through their lives, hear her messages and her voice and that they will feel comforted and feel the joy of the privileges that all of us have had we thank thee, Father, for being in a large family and large friends, and thank thy Son for all the knowledge that we have. And we say these things most gratefully with full heart. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Please stand. Robert Briggs will lead down the chapel to the double door to their left. Mr. Alder will please come forward and line up just outside the door. 